Hello and welcome to the final day of MD and DI's Focus on Fundamentals three-day course, Shifting Requirements and Expectations for the Chemical Characterization of Medical Devices, sponsored by Nelson Laboratories. Today's class is entitled, Discussion of Feedback Received Directly from the FDA on Chemtox. My name is Peter Kress, and I will be your moderator today. Before we get started, I have a few very quick announcements. First of all, this webinar is designed to be interactive. There's a dock of widgets at the bottom of your screen that will let you learn about today's speakers, download resources, share this webinar via social media, and participate in the Q&A session that we'll have toward the end. The slides will advance automatically throughout the event. You can download a copy of the slides. You can do that, go to the resources widget. Toward the end of the webinar today, I'll ask you to complete a survey. That's found on the right-hand side of your screen. And I hope you'll take a minute to fill out this uh, survey form before you leave us today. Your feedback will provide us with valuable information on how we can improve events in the future. Finally, if you have any technical issues during this webinar, please click the Help widget. That's at the bottom of your screen. You can also type your issue into the Q&A area. And either way, we'll be glad to offer one-on-one -on -one assistance. Let's move on to our class, Discussion of Feedback Received Directly from the FDA on Chemtox. Today, we, our main speaker is Dr. Matthew Jorgensen. He's a senior chemist and toxicologist at Nelson Labs. And Matt will be getting additional commentary and help with the Q&A from Thor Rollins. He's the Director of Toxicology and e &L Consulting at Nelson Labs. Uh, to learn more about our speakers, you can visit the BIOS widget. That's BIOS, like biographies. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Matthew Jorgensen. Matt, please. Hi, and uh, thanks, Peter, for the uh, for the introduction. And, and again, uh, to all the uh, folks uh, attending these presentations, this is uh, day three, as as Peter said. So um, so so today, it's it's really kind of an e extension of what we've been talking about. On day one and, and day two, uh, though, though we get in, uh, into a little bit more of the nitty gritty with uh, really specific feedback that we've received over and over from uh, from the FDA, <clears throat> I would say that you know part of the the topics in this uh, in this presentation kind of uh, assume the some of the background that we talked about in the first two days. So you know, just just to recap very very briefly, on day one we talked about how expectations have been changing when it comes to chemistry for toxicology, and there's a little bit of a uh, toxicological risk assessment background piece in there. And then you know, yesterday we talked about material evaluations and and how to make sure that materials are compliant with the the CMRs um, as part of the MDR. And so, so now we're going to continue that conversation, uh, looking at some other areas of feedback that we've received from the FDA. Um, I, I kind of wanted to touch on one question uh, that came up in the first presentation. Uh, somebody had asked me later, uh, so are these, is all this feedback from just one correspondence with the FDA regarding a specific project or is it broader than that? And, and really, these uh, things that we show here, I, I'm copying and pasting them uh, directly from pieces of FDA feedback. Uh, you know, making sure it's anonymized, of course. Uh, but it, we we see this same feedback over and over. So we handle a really high volume of these uh, across many different device types. Oftentimes, this feedback comes in in a very like like rapid turnaround type situation. So we. We uh, receive feedback. We we help respond within a day or two. Um, I think it's happened uh, like three times this week. Uh, and so so it's not just one submission. It's not just one device type. It's it's really broader than that. Even though these comments are copied and pasted from <clears throat> individual submissions. Uh, the the other thing that I wanted to touch on that that I don't know that we really uh, hit on very good in the first uh, presentations was. Um, this, this sort of group effort that really should go into doing chemistry for toxicology or, or chemtox, as uh, as I call it. Um, so, so when approaching these projects, I, I think historically, and historically means you know greater than two or three years ago, I feel like talk, the the group of people that did toxicological risk assessment was kind of siloed 
separately from the folks doing chemistry evaluations and separate from those doing uh, biological uh, evaluation plans and, and risk assessments. And so what would happen is a, a medical device would need uh, to go through this process. They're biocomp experts in-house, or you know maybe they'd contract with somebody at, outside of the company. The biocomp experts would make one thing and give this plan to chemists that are completely separated, you know, at company B. And then after all of this process with the, the planning and chemistry is done, it would go to yet a third group, let's say company C, uh, to do this toxicological risk assessment. And this, this setup of having these people kind of separated from each other or, or these tasks separated from each other is, is, is a little bit of a recipe for disaster, right? Because uh, as we've learned so far, you know, that – the, the toxicologist and, and biocompatibility experts, they really need to inform, you know, exactly how this chemistry study is going to be going to be done, right? And and the, the toxicologist also needs to know, you know, what are the biological endpoints or what are the, the end objectives um, of the study? And that's that's part of the reason why I, I love this slide. So you can see uh, you know, this is just, just a small part of the advisory services group at Nelson Labs, and you, and you can see me there in the middle. I'm the one uh, looking uh, con confused. But you can see, you know, Thor Rollins, who has a super duper deep background in, in biocompatibility, has been planning out and strategizing on the right way to do biological uh, evaluations for for more than a decade, right? I think 18 years. So we have him and chemists and toxicologists all together to make a coherent and cohesive plan through the through the entire process as opposed to having those groups siloed. So I would say uh, when approaching all of this, especially with the heightened scrutiny that chemistry for toxicology has had, I would say like in the design phase of this process, uh, you, you really need to have the toxicologist that's going to be making these claims at the very end and signing their name to this, you need to have them uh, in the front end uh, before you even start the, the chemistry process in order for this to be effective. So with that, I'll just uh, you know go through, I mean basically this is a, a rapid fire discussion of stuff that uh, we've heard over and over from the FDA um, it, with a little bit more emphasis on identifications and, and quantification uh, issues. Uh, including, you know, things about about reporting. One of the things that I, I wanted to start with here, so you can see, you know, I'm showing feedback that we've received both uh, in pre-subs and as part of, uh, you know, additional information requests or, ma or major deficiency response requests. And this, uh, you know, reminds me to touch on this this power of the, the pre-sub, right? So So we see the same feedback. Oftentimes, it's the same feedback word for word uh, in both pre-sub uh, commentary and in uh, major deficiencies. And so, you know, of course, I, I think it makes a lot of sense that, uh, that, that you want to have this feedback or it's better to have this feedback up front, either uh, ahead of starting testing or, you know, even while testing is in, in play, if you, uh, you know, if you initiate testing while you're waiting for a pre-sub. It's better to have this feedback sooner rather than later, and uh, the, the pre-sub process is a great way to do that, and it is something that, that we help with routinely. You know, we, uh, we support pre-subs, and we'll talk to the FDA for you and all these sorts of things, um, and, and this is something that, that I would highly recommend. Okay, so, so here's some feedback from the FDA on identifications. Uh, I hate to read slides, but... You know, this is how that feedback comes in. So I'm just going to read this a little bit, uh, and then we'll talk about it some more. So uh, it says, please provide information on the identification process, including a description of the method or algorithm used, for example, spectral reference library, match scores, range of possible scores, and significance. And then, you know, and that, that was, the, you know, some pre-sub feedback. Uh, so the same thing is repeated down below in the in the deficiency, uh, and then it says, you know, additionally, please please provide supporting information for all ex extractables, including predicted structures, molecular formulas, molecular weights. Uh, if multiple identity uh, identities, multiple potential identities were identified, uh, then please include all of those. And so so really, what they're asking for 
is a lot of additional information on how this identification process was was executed. And I think that there's a good reason for that. I, and this the the motivation is that there have been some some examples where it's it's become clear that the quality of identifications produced by an ana analytical lab are, are pretty variable. <clears throat> and I think that the FDA has uh, you know seen a few of these you know maybe more poor examples of identifications and and become you know really concerned about the the quality of identifications that's that's coming into these reports and as a as a toxicologist that reviews uh chemistry results from from everywhere um you know I've also seen some some pretty bad chemistry reports as well so I I think that it's it's uh, a good time for folks that are in the business of toxicology and, and biocompatibility to take a step back and say, okay, you know, we, we need to understand this chemistry a little bit better and we need to make sure that we're setting the bar high enough uh, on these IDs to make sure that we're really confident in, in the conclusions that we're, we're going to make. So, so to just kind of like help explain this a little bit more and I was like the chemistry professor and me coming out I just we I think we should just like talk a little bit about how these identifications uh, really work so so when we make an identification uh, using something like uh, gas chromatography with mass spectroscopy the way that that works is you know you have this complicated mixture of chemicals that came out of the device during the extraction and that gets injected into the instrument and the uh, chromatography part of that instrument separates those uh, chemicals from each other so that they all like leave the chromatography part at different times. And the amount of time that it takes for the chemical to leave the, the, the column is called the retention time. And, and this retention time is, is pretty unique to the, the geometry of a molecule, how polar it is, and so on and so forth. And so lots of different molecules come off the column at, at different times. So we can kind of start to identify what something is based off of that amount at that amount of time. That that's called the retention time. And then after uh, they get separated from each other, then they basically get blasted by like an electron machine gun and just get blown apart, right? And and uh, those weights of those pieces are are separated from each other and and counted. And that results in, in a mass spectrum. So you can see on your screen, this is the mass spectrum of benzoic acid. This is like a standardized one that I took off of the, the NIST uh, database on, online. Um, you know, whenever you go through like this process of machine gunning uh, molecules, you know, most of them break up, but not, not every single molecule breaks up. And so if you look at the weights of pieces, there's some... Uh, the, the heaviest pieces are ones that didn't break up, and then you have like the weights of all the different uh, the, the different fragments. Um, the the good news is is that uh, at least for GC, the results of this exploding process is is pretty reproducible. And you know, diehard chemists like me who have chosen to sit alone in a dimly lit room in the company of of instruments rather than uh, friends have done a great job of just amassing loads and loads of GCMS data. It's all cataloged into these databases. For example, the NIST database, which is growing all the time, the, the last time I checked, uh, inside the NIST database is something like 300,000 mass spectra of, of compounds. Uh, you can use the NIST database for, for free if you know what molecule you're looking at. So for example, I went there and said, okay, benzoic acid, show me what the mass spectrum is like. Um, if you want to do the opposite, like a reverse lookup, then that's something that you, uh, that you can't do for free. Um, and, and so the way that the, the first line approach to make these IDs is that these mass spectra and retention times are collected, and then that information is compared in a reverse lookup fashion to uh, huge public databases and also to, to private databases. For GCMS, this works, you know, really well with, you know, with public databases. I'll, I'll explain where there's some, some weaknesses uh, in just a second. Uh, for LCMS and, and, and LC uh, high resolution accurate mass, uh, it's a little bit more complicated. Um, the results of this exploding molecules process is more variable uh, depending on experimental conditions and the, the specific instrument and, and a whole bunch of other things. So it's really not so easy 
to make a big public database for LCMS and LCHRAM just because it's so parameter dependent. Uh, so to, to address this, what labs have done, like Nelson Labs, is you know we've been just amassing with, with our own very specific instruments and our set processes. We've been like amassing uh, you know information collected by LCMS and LCHRAM that we can use to make these identifications using our own our own private database. And so so just to kind of like shed some light on where the FDA has been concerned with with this process, I think that where they primarily ha primarily have some heartburn is when only uh, an automated automated identification is made to a big public database. So, so for example, it, it, you know, I don't know how easy it is to see on all of your screens, but in the upper left-hand corner of this slide, there's a mass spectrum of a, of a compound that was found in an extractables analysis. And you can feed these mass spectra and um, and retention times into software like like uh, ChemStation or or other other ones similar to that, and and the software is, is awesome, and it'll report the highest match to the public database no matter what. So so it'll report a match 100% of the time, even if the match is really bad, right? So they're just it's you know it's, it's like a robot. It just just finds the the highest match, and if you only do that. So most of the time it's great, but sometimes there isn't a good match in the database because the, the real compound might not actually be in the NIST database, even though the NIST database is huge. And in those cases, uh, this automated process will report a molecule that's like completely false, like it, it's not the real molecule at all. And if you don't have uh, like human beings reviewing that data and scrutinizing what the automated process produced, you easily can run into situations where uh, the the wrong molecule, like like an obviously wrong molecules, are being reported as being in the the uh, you know coming from the device when when they weren't. So this is like this is an example where you know at least these two molecules have like similar elements and, and functional groups where you know. The mass spectra led to one thing from NIST, uh, but we we know for certain that instead of being the, the molecule that NIST said, it's really uh, the the oligomer, the cyclic oligomer that that's shown on the bottom um, right. And and so this is the type of thing that the FDA really really wants to avoid happening. Uh, I think it's a it's a fair ask on their part that more than just a machine, um, you know, takes takes a look at this data. And so, you know, I, I guess the, the story is here that, you know, really a lot of extra caution is needed with identifications. Maybe, you know, the FDA is asking for a lot of detail on how these things are ID'd and, you know, lots of supporting information. Um, you know, maybe it's a little bit too much information that they're asking for, but it comes from a good place and, and for a good reason because there's been this kind of like history of less than than awesome um, IDs being made by uh, by automated systems, and so you know when I think about this, I, I think that there's you know really different levels of quality of identification that that you can think about, um, where the the worst level of quality or like the the yeah really really the lowest level of quality is where every compound called out is just whatever the highest match was using an automated process. Uh, you know, one step better than that is already a lot better. So that's if you have this whole automated process, but then a, an expert in chemistry, um, you know, peer reviews and checks that and weeds out all the ridiculous, crazy matches. Um, you know, one thing better than that, and I think that this is what, you know, the FDA really expects is to have an automated ID, both with a public and a private database, you know, usually this this private database is um, is supplementing these big public ones in kind of like a targeted way. So, so for example, the ones that we try to build, these are you know containing compounds specific from medical device materials that we know are absent from from the NIST. So that that private database really adds a lot. And then with if you have the peer review there, now that the quality of identification is getting you know really uh, 
you know, really a lot better. And then, then finally, you can do even a little bit more than that, and that's where not only are there these auto identifications with public and private databases, uh, but then there's also a, more of a manual identification element there where uh, a, a materials expert will like take in the context of the entire device. So they'll say, okay, here's what the databases say, that's how good they match, and I know that this is, you know, a uh, specific rubber that we've seen 10 times before, and, and actually that informs me in saying that, you know, these are what the compounds are. So that, that's probably the, the best um, that, that, that can happen in terms of quality. Um, of course, the, the higher the quality goes, like the timeline for these things stretches out, and, uh, and it becomes more and more difficult to get that level of quality for, for every compound. Okay, so let's uh, keep on going with the, you know some of this feedback directly uh, from the FDA on these. So, so here's one that we've uh, seen several times is we do not recommend choosing a structure associated with the highest match factor. So there they're basically directly saying what, what I've been trying to explain that you know they don't want just a machine <laughs> to make these, uh, these calls. Okay, they say all potential identifications should be provided so they can be considered in a toxicological risk assessment. That again goes back to this automated ID thing. So, so when software like Mass Center or ChemStation um, provides these uh, spectral matches, they often will provide several, several of them. So the way that you know, I most commonly see it is you'll, you'll see this uh, thing that you're trying to identify, like it's spectrum and then the top five matches. And so really what the FDA is saying is like, if there's like a group of possible matches, you really should consider the entire group. Um, they say substances which only partial structural data is, uh, is available uh, should be designated as an unknown for the purposes of toxicological risk assessment. This is one where I would say depending on what else is known about the, the molecule. So there's there's lots of cases where we have partial structural data and we know enough about the class of the compound that, that it's good enough to make a, a good toxicological risk assessment without considering it to be a full unknown. Um, but if we don't know enough, then certainly you, know, you should consider that to be an unknown. Then finally, I mean, this, this last one always kind of like makes me laugh a little bit, but so if a class of substances is to be listed as the identification, then all potential members of that class should be provided. And, and this is another example where, you know, it, it makes sense on the surface, but then when you start to like extrapolate that out and think about how to implement that, it can get really tricky. So for example, um, one case where we often will list an identification class is when we have like, we have aliphatic hydrocarbons. So and these are often reported as something like C4 alkanes or C5 alkanes and so on. And the reason why they're re reported like that as a class or a group um, is because these compounds by themselves, like an individual isomer or linkage of those carbon atoms by itself, is extremely difficult to separate from other linkages that have the same number of, of carbons. And so from instruments, these compounds all come off at once, and they all look the same from a, a mass spectrum sort of perspective. And so uh, for the C6 alkanes, you know, it's really, really difficult to tell the difference between its five members. And so we'll just say C6 alkane. Um, and, you know, what, what? if we were to take what the FDA said, you know, super literally, then we should list out those C6 uh, alkanes like I, I think I have there on the left. But the more it's a, it's kind of like um, one of these problems where it's more than exponentially growing. Um, it's like a factorial, right? So the larger the number, the C, the the more members of the group there are uh, coming. And so for C12 alkanes, which is another one that we uh, report out, you know, commonly, there's you know 355 members of those. And if we really had to list out each one, I mean, it would be ridiculous. Uh, we do sometimes see up to C32 alkanes, and there, there's two, you know, 27.7 billion members of that group. So, I think that you know we we have to understand the spirit of what the FDA is saying. Uh, you know, of course, literally, if we had to report out all of these, 
then we we couldn't right because there's just not enough paper to be listing out these billions and billions of members of the the C32 alkane group. Okay, so there's there's a lot of feedback from the FDA on how these identifications should take place. Then there's also you know feedback on how and what what sort of information should be included in the reporting for this. And so, and so that's what I want to talk about here. So when they talk about stuff that should be included in the report, and I know this first bullet is a little bit more about quantification that we'll talk about in a second, but they say, okay, when reporting this, you should have calibration data that demonstrates the suitability of the calibration method across the, the range. Uh, they, they want to see chromatographic data that includes labeling so that they can see what this retention time and signal intensity is like. And then, uh, for all of these substances that are higher than the analytical evaluation threshold, or AET, so, so when you make an identification, then this is what they want to see for each of those IDs. They want to see retention time, proposed identities, the chemical name, uh, the CAS number, and I, I would say here it should say CAS numbers because it is true that uh, you know, lots of compounds have more than one CAS number. Uh, structural descriptors, like a like a smiles structure or, or an actual picture of the structure itself. The identification quantification or identification level, type of identification data used, quantification method. Uh, you know, concentration finally, and then the quantity <laughs> in uh, in micrograms per device. So, so basically, to me, this reflects just a high level of skepticism and that they want as much information uh, really as we can as we can provide okay so so let's talk about some feedback that's a little bit more specific to quantification and, and here i have again some some information that we see in the feedback uh, like pre-sub feedback and then also in deficiency responses so here they say the the fda recommends that method qualification includes multiple standards. For example, at least five for each polarity of LCMS over a range of retention times so that the reporting limit and dynamic range is demonstrated for analytes with a variety of chemical properties. Okay, and they, then they also say when a response factor is unknown, we recommend that methods are used that avoid underestimation of analyte concentration. So uh, this type of feedback I think is again uh, spawned from, you know, a, a, just a few bad examples where where maybe uh, some quantifications were made in the past by by labs without really using a lot of expert scientific judgment. So so it is possible if you if you are careless to uh, to do this process in a way that that isn't very scientifically valid. You know, some of these examples um, you know have made their way to the FDA. They they don't you know, like these types of surprises, and so now they're asking for all this additional uh, detail and information. You can see it, it's really pretty much the same thing in the major deficiency feedback uh, on the bottom uh, half. They say you have not provided detailed information on the standards used, and uh, so on the top one it was talking just about LCMS, but down here it says we recommend at least three reference standards for GCMS, and then five reference standards for LCMS, each with five data, paint, data points per standard and covering a range of chemical properties. So, so this is what they're asking for uh, as part of the support for the quality of quantification. And, and just like how I explained a little bit about the identification process, to understand uh, where this is coming from, we need to talk about how quantification can be done uh, when we're doing these these screening studies, so so one way that this can be done, and this is uh, you know something that what I'm hearing from the FDA is that they don't like, right? Is where that all of these semi quantifications. So when you screen, uh, you anticipate seeing molecules that you've not measured before, and that that you don't have a calibration curve for. And so you have to estimate those concentrations somehow. And so uh, when you do that, one way is to assume that the, the compound that you're looking for, in the case of this slide, it would, it's labeled EXT, it's like an external compound, that the compound that you're looking for behaves the same in your instrument as your internal standard behaves. 
So anytime that you, you're, you're measuring how much of something there is by GCMS or LCMS, you're looking at how does the concentration of that compound relate to the intensity of the signal, which is, is measured in air, units of area. And so if you, for example, had a compound, uh, if, if your internal standard is at 10 milligrams per liter, and that produced an, a signal area of 100, and then you had an unknown compound come through that you haven't yet identified, and that had a signal area of 100, you would say, oh, okay, so that's, that's uh, also at a concentration of 10 milligrams per liter. If the area were uh, 50 instead of 100, you would say 5 milligrams per liter, and so on and so forth. It's kind of like the internal standard uh, being used as a one-point calibration curve for all the compounds that you, that you see, right? And, and so it's true that you do have to estimate the concentration of these screen compounds somehow. Um, I, I think that just using your internal standard is not something that, that uh, you, you know, you might have to use it sometimes, but, but there are definitely better ways to do that. And, and what the FDA is, is pointing out in their, um, in their last feedback is they say, okay, well, well, rather than just use an internal standard, what you should have is in addition to the internal standard, you should have some surrogates. So at least five by LCMS and at least three by GCMS. And these are compounds with you know differing properties that you've made detailed calibration curves for. And, and for uh, each of these, when you see a new compound that you've not, uh, you, you need to estimate the concentration for it, you should identify it first and then estimate its concentration using the calibration curve of something that's similar to it. And they want to make sure that you have enough of these um, surrogate calibration curves included in your method so that you have some options to choose a surrogate that, that makes sense. And, and you know, so I, I see where they're coming from on that. To me, that the, there is some, some, validity, some validity there. Like, rather than arbitrarily use a single one-point calibration curve, it makes sense to select the, the right calibration curve or the best um, fitting or most similar calibration curve from those that are in your, your surrogates. Uh, the, the way that we have been running this at, at Nielsen Labs is, so sure, we have some, uh, some surrogates with calibration curves that are in there in the, in the mix, right? And we can use those. Uh, but what we've also been doing is, you know, measuring these, the response factors of all of these count compounds that we add to our, our database, and now we have, you know, thousands of these in there. So we've, we've collected, like, we have, like, full, rigorous, and detailed surrogates, you know, for when the FDA asks and we need it. But we also have thousands of, uh, of more brief calibration curves from when we added all of the things to our database. So usually we refer to those measurements that we have in addition to the, to the surrogates. But I, I think that this idea of you know, moving away from only using an internal standard, I think that that's really pretty rock solid. I, I don't see the FDA moving away from that anytime, anytime soon. So, okay. So, so that's kind of kind of the identification process. And uh, that's why the FDA is asking some of these questions. They want to make sure that the, um, the, the quantification process is better than just using an internal standard because they've seen examples where just using a, a single internal standard starts to get um, kind, of, kind of, it can go bad. Um, okay, so, so IDs. And, um, and, and quantification, and then, then I wanted to touch on a little bit what they've been saying about reporting, and especially when it comes to this idea in general of providing justifications, right? So, so just take a look at this uh, series of FDA comments uh, coming from a few different recent uh, pieces of feedback. So they said, please provide justification information that the tested coupons appropriately represent the final finished device. So it's not enough to just say, okay, we used uh, coupons to represent the device. They want further explanation on why that's the case. Okay, next bullet, please provide a clear justification for choice of extraction conditions, including the extraction duration and why this is representative of worst case clinical use. So let's just 
pause there and think about that just for a second. So for a long time, uh, we've used, and by we, I, I mean kind of like the chemistry for toxicology community at large, you know, it, it's pretty common to use extraction conditions from ISO 10993-12 and, and also, you know, repeated in 10993-18, you know, 50 degrees C for 72 hours. And this has been more or less uh, standard, you know, or uh, um, the FDA has asked for exhaustive extraction conditions where, you know, you want to extract out for a duration of time until, uh, you know, you're down to 10% or less uh, per unit time of total extractable amount. Uh, but, but in the past, you could include, you could use or include those conditions uh, just because they're like a matter of policy and, and expectation on the part of uh, regulators is something like, you know, we're standing by something decided, 50 degrees C for 72 hours. Uh, but what we've been seeing more and more is if you use 50 degrees C for 72 hours or if you use exhaustive, it's not just enough to say we extracted exhaustively. They want an explanation why that's representative of worst case clinical use conditions. So now um, it's, it's more than just following uh, some sort of protocol, you really need to start scientifically defending this in writing in the report that gets in front of the FDA. Um, and, and the same goes on for the, the next bullet. So they said, we recommend that you provide justification for choice of extraction solvent in this simulated use extraction study and why it's representative. So again, it's not just picking one that's off of a, an official list. We have to understand and explain the, the why part. And then, you know, there was one, you know, particular case uh, that came in, I think, two weeks ago where I remembered that they had, like, asked for a lot of these, like, explain why uh, things. And in that one, uh, there were 29 pieces of, of feedback related to chemistry and, and toxicology, and every single one of those asked for a justification why some sort of uh, decision was made. So this also to me represents a sort of like like a shift where you know maybe they've been asking for a lot more detail with with chemistry and they've kind of like made a bunch of uh, policy decisions on for example requiring exhaustive extractions and, and the three solvents a, a polar a midpolar and nonpolar and so on uh, but you know when they just apply those recommendations in a blanketed fashion then they hear back from people like like me, Dr. Jorgensen, where I'm like, oh, well, wait a second, you know, exhaustive extraction doesn't make sense because this is an all-metal device and for X, Y, and Z reasons. And they, they might be like, okay, wait, well, maybe if they can explain why, then, you know, they can be a little bit flexible. So I think that that's what they're looking for is, the, the, you know, acknowledgement of their policies. And if you deviate in any way that you should explain why, and even if you don't deviate, you should explain uh, why. You're doing that. I mean, in effect, if if you take a look at uh, at what the FDA is asking uh, with the identifications and the quantifications, uh, and then all of these explanations on on why you're doing things, I mean, they're really asking for a lot. You know, I I think that they're, for my position, they're they're asking for the moon here. Um, you know, I don't know that it's wrong or or ill-hearted of them to to want the moon. Uh, it's big and, and beautiful, but it, it's also, you know, really not possible, right? To, to provide all of the level of detail and all from all of this feedback that we've seen, um, it, it's really not possible. But what we can do, and what I what I'm suggesting is that rather than try to give them the moon and get frustrated because it's not possible, uh, we we really have to put our scientist hats on here. All, I mean, all of us that make any of these submissions. And, you know, we'll give them our, our moon rock and explain, you know, why that's enough. You know, why is it enough to say, okay, look at this part of this huge, you know, thing that we, um, you know, that we can't do. And, and this is why it's good enough. And, and explain with justification uh, why. So I think that that's, that's really kind of like the, the takeaway here. Understand that they want something that we can't give, even though it's good. Uh, be prepared to explain you know why what we can give is is good enough. So so from there, uh, I don't want to take up uh, you know too much time uh, that you know because I want to leave some time for questions. But I thought I would just like step through uh, just quickly a report to talk to show how how we're trying to address some of these types of feedbacks. 
Um, you know, even then, so I, I think I pulled this uh, these screenshots out of a report that's you know now maybe four months old, and even in between now and then, um, I feel like these uh, these reports are being updated. It's a really dynamic time. So, so what I think you should include in your reports are you know at least what you see here and probably a little bit more at this point. So, so the the reports should always include a study purpose where it's like clearly explain uh you know what was the the intent of of the study and this type of thing the study purpose inside a chemistry report i think is an indicator or flag to the fda um, that this was conducted by a lab intending to do chemistry for medical device toxicology as opposed to a lab uh, that does just strictly environmental work that that um, uh, you know that that the the medical device manufacturer isn't kind of like retrofitting or repurposing into a medical device chemistry type lab. So so the study purpose I think should be there uh, for sure. You have to have this analytical evaluation threshold articulated in the in the report. Make sure that that's like shown explicitly. Otherwise, for, you're, you're going to get a, a question no matter what. Uh, sample preparation of the analytical samples. I, you know, had another uh, question from the FDA from, from a different lab uh, where this was exactly the information that they were asking for that wasn't included in the report. So they want, you know, details about, uh, you know, what internal standards were used, what surrogates were used, you know, was there a liquid-liquid extraction, how did that work out, all of that stuff uh, should be in there. Uh, when you're reporting results, I think I showed you that, that list before where the FDA was asking for tons and tons of stuff. Uh, so, so we include a lot of that, um, though we don't include all of it, right? So you can see what's included here. We have the name, the CAS number, or some other unique identifying number, the retention time, and then, of course, the result in micrograms per unit, um, along with the identification quality level uh, from, from our perspective, right? So you can see IC is a compound that we feel 100% confident on, Whereas something like an MPC, we say is a most probable compound that we we feel uh, is better than uh, a tick or an automated ID, but it, it's not 100% confirmed. That that type of thing. Um, we also in our reports include you know pictures of the structure. This is really useful to toxicologists. If there's ever any ambiguity about a name or uh, a cast number, which sometimes there is, uh, then then this structure can really uh, can really help with that. Okay, with that, yeah, I think I'll go ahead and uh, and and close out. So, uh, as Thor and I said in the first two days, there's really, really a lot of um, of ground that we could cover here. These presentations uh, can stretch on forever if they would just let me talk that long, um, uh, but we don't have time for that. So, if you want to learn any more, you can always reach out to Thor and I. But there's also a lot of like pre-recorded and pre uh, and, and you know and written stuff. Uh, that we put out there, both from the Nielsen Lab side and the Sterogenic side, covering a range of topics well beyond uh, just chemistry for medical device toxicology. Um, you know, here's our contact information. Please feel free to to write us or uh, or give us a call on the phone. We love to chat about this. And uh, and with that, I'll see um, uh, I'll see if we have any questions that we can uh, can pivot to. Great. Thanks, Matt. This is Peter, your moderator. I'm back. We do have questions, which is great. Before we get to the Q&A, however, I'd like to remind everyone about the webinar survey, which I mentioned earlier. It's still available on the right of the presentation window. If you close the survey, you can reopen the widget. To do that, just click the icon along the bottom of your screen. Thanks in advance for filling out the feedback form. Your participation in this survey will help us to serve you better in the future. All right, let's go into our Q&A, and we do have questions. Okay, uh, our first one comes from uh, Johan, who says, we found a high level of TOC on a titanium implant. However, running the extract of the contaminated product on GC slash MS did not give any peaks. What would be the most likely type of contamination and what other method could identify those? Maybe LC slash MS. 
<laughs> well, uh, Johan, I think that that's an awesome question and an, an interesting analytical problem, right? So uh, I don't. So the short answer is is that I don't really know, right? But certainly I can speculate on a couple of things, right? So so one thing that I would say is that when you run TOC on a titanium implant, TOC is only compatible uh, with with water, right? And so uh, you know you extract the the titanium device in water, and then that water gets analyzed. Uh, you know this all the organic stuff is oxidized, and you, and you measure um, the total amount of carbon that that in the water. Um, when you do GCMS, you would extract that device in water, and then you have to do this liquid-liquid extraction, and uh, and often there's a concentration or blowdown step, where so you you would uh, take the water that has the organic stuff in it, you would transfer those to methylene chloride, and then you concentrate that down. But this whole process of liquid-liquid extraction and concentration uh, has to be done very carefully, and there's ways that that can go wrong, and this is one of the things that the FDA gets you know, really nervous about. So one thing that could be is that uh, in the TOC experiment, it's a little bit more directly executed on the water itself that was exposed to the, the device. But with GCMS, there's a few different steps there in between where depending on what the exactly was done for the liquid-liquid extraction and concentration step, and also depending on the, the sensitivity of your instrument, some of those compounds could, uh, could, could be lost, right? So, you know, that's one of the things that I would think about first, especially if you say you had a high level of TOC and then things were lost, uh, and that, but not by GC, to me, that sounds like maybe it was a little bit more of a, a, on, the, on the volatile side of semi-volatiles, and then during the concentration blowdown step, you know, maybe it got lost. So it's kind of some speculation. If uh, you, you know, email me like the details of the GCMS, uh, GCMS experiment could probably give a more specific answer. Okay, good. All right, next question comes from Avi, a question about coupons. For the testing coupons, do we need to replicate the component of a device if patient contact is improbable? For example, a marker band that's completely enclosed between two materials. Yeah, that's uh, that's that's a great question, and you know I'll comment just briefly on that, but then I, I think I'll let uh, Thor uh, give his feedback on that one as well. So, so I would say that uh, if you're going to test a coupon, that it really should be patient contacting materials only, uh, but you also need to make sure that all of the processing on those patient contacting materials is, is included. Thor, would you have anything to add to that? No, it's, it's pretty much that. The only other thing is you really want to be able to justify that whatever you're not including in your coupon one doesn't impact the processing, like Matt said, but also could not ever touch liquid or some type and then get back into the patient, even in a failure scenario. But if you can replicate the processing and justify that that material would never come in contact with the patient, then we would not include it, want to include it in the coupon because then you're just including compounds or biocompatibility risks for something that does not have patient contact. Uh, question from Ryan. Uh, when the FDA asks for five standards by LCMS, do they really mean they want five for each of the positive and negative LCMS? This seems excessive. Well, you know, Ryan, I think that the FDA does ask for some excessive uh, things sometimes. And, and so if it, if it is excessive, it sounds like it, it could be par for the course. But the, the way that I... Um, and, and again, I don't mean to be sassy to the FDA because I really do love them uh, a lot. They do a great job. Uh, I, the way we understand that it really is in uh, both positive and negative modes of the, the LCMS. Okay. Question from Barry asks, uh, what are some of the justifications you've seen for why a customer may use 50 degrees at 72 hours for extraction? What are some of the justifications you've seen for that? Yeah, yeah, 
Barry, that's a good question, and it's one that I'm, you know, excited to answer because it's something that, without exaggeration, I've I've probably spent just, you know, in easily in excess of of 80 hours. It's just lots of lots of time discussing this and uh, going back and forth with the FDA on these matters. We did a, a pre-sub with them, uh, you know, a Nielsen Labs pre-sub with the FDA just on this uh, point, and. And uh, really, what what our argument is is that 50 degrees C at 72 hours is is exaggerated enough to be you know really conservatively protective of of patient safety, whilst avoiding some of the issues that can uh, that can come along for for longer duration type extractions, right? So so we feel that if you use uh, you know 37 degrees C, you know that's you know that's acceptable, but not as protective as we we would like to be, given the uncertainties between the relationship and, and like how we extract it in a jar and how it is in a human. And, and we like the factor of three going out uh, for a longer duration than 24 hours. So so we take 50 degrees C in 72 hours and say that's what comes out every every day at body temperature. Um, but but we feel like going out longer than that is really excessive, and when you do go out longer than that, you run the risk of uh, of losing compounds and compounds degrading, and there's a whole host of uh, of issues that that arise. So normally we make that type of explanation that 50 degrees C, 72 hours, it's like it's like more than a factor of three conservative compared to what we expect in the body, notwithstanding how aggressive those solvents are compared to the body, and that anything more than that. Uh, is both too excessive in terms of conditions, and it introduced uncertainty and risks related to compound recovery. Okay. Our next question comes from Sabiha. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Here's the question. Um, does cleaning and disinfecting agent residuals on a reusable device over its life cycle, should that be considered from the analysis per 10993-18? Is this reprocessing endpoint important, and can you share some examples? Okay, so I'll I'll give a quick comment, and then I'll also send it over to Thor to to see what he says. And and Thor, um, you know, I know that there's been some movement on reusable devices and expectations there. So please feel free to to interrupt me or correct me if I start to go off base. But um, my understanding is this for reusable devices that that uh, really the initial biocompatibility before it gets reprocessed over and over again, so the conditions in which it could contact the patient the first time are often viewed as the riskiest conditions in terms of biocompatibility. So a lot of the, the biocompatibility testing, including uh, if we are going to do chemistry on those types of devices, would be you know, not in its fully reprocessed state, right? But now that that doesn't mean that this whole reprocessing process, including all of these contact and disinfecting agents and cleaners and so on, aren't considered. Because when you go through a reusable uh, device cleaning validation, right, they they check these endpoints like residual uh, chemicals on the reusable device, uh, and they do cytotoxicity on those, and that kind of provides a checkpoint that you are not losing the state of biocompatibility that was there when it was initially tested before all of these use uh, cycles. And it, and it could be, uh, and this is where, Thor, maybe I'll defer to you, but there's, there's some movement to really show biocompatibility more fully again at the end of the product's life cycle after however many useful lives it has. Thor, do you have any comment on that? Yeah, I do. Uh, just, it, it's compounding what you just said, which is most of the time if you do biocompatibility on a, on a new device without being processed, if that's how a device could be used, so if the device is going to be used clinically without being processed the very first time, there could be residual manufacturing on there that your cleaning uh, could yeah. remove, and so we'd want to perform the biocompatibility. But like Matt said, in a cleaning validation, we do want to make sure biocompatibility isn't impacted by either material breaking down during the cleaning and, and making new leachables or residual from the cleaning process itself. 
Now, subtle talks has historically been done that way. Me personally, I actually like, and, and we're looking at a movement this way, um, using chemistry to really help look at this because what we can do, if you ran chemistry before, we can do a new chemical analysis and really look for residual cleaners and, and not even if they're present, but now we actually have an amount instead of subtle talks just failing and not knowing, you know, does that mean anything? We can do this tox assessment that Matt's talked about to really understand the impact of that residual cleaner being there. Or we can see if the materials changed sufficiently and now has, you know, more toxins or possible uh, compounds that may be toxic leaching due to the cleaning process. Uh, so that's not standard. Most people run cytotox, but we do see a push more that way to truly understand the impact of the cleaning and not just have a pass fail with cytotox. Okay, great. Our next question comes from Andrew, who asks, how should the uh, quantitation of unknowns work, assuming we don't have a good partial identification? It doesn't seem like we could use RRF. Yeah, Andrew, that's that is a great uh great comment and question. So so that goes back to this whole idea and understanding of the analytical evaluation threshold. So that that forms the framework for why uh we use um an AET in the first place. So um the AET is based on the assumption that the compound is unknown. Uh and so you know, that means that we can't, you're, you're right, we can't use an RRF because an RRF, that, that's relative response factor, is, you know, we have to have that identified first in order to be able to use that. And it also means that we can't use a surrogate to estimate the concentration of this unknown first because that also requires the identification of the compound. And so the AET assumes that the compound is completely unknown, and then we uh, use and, and that's why we use this, so the TTC, the threshold of toxicological concern, to derive the AET. And then we take that TTC and we divide that by what we say is natural variation in the quantification of compounds when it's just, you know, just the internal standard is used. So uh, these unknowns, they use that one point, the internal standard, uh, but we have knowledge of how, of what the variation of quantification is like to an internal standard. And, and this is the percent relative standard deviation of these RRFs. And so that tells us how variable that quantification is, and that makes this uncertainty factor that goes into the AET calculation. So we take a TTC, and then we divide it by an uncertainty factor that's representative of, of how precise our uh, you know, measurement of unknowns are. <laughs> so so yeah, that's a that's a great question and you were you're you're right. We can't use an RRF or a specific RRF in that. Okay, great. Looks like we have time for one more quick question. This one comes from Satish. What percentage of of quality match for an unknown compound can be considered for evaluation while matching the NIST library? What percentage of quality yeah. match? Yeah. I, great questions to teach, and and the the answer I don't think that you're gonna really uh, like very much, but the, <laughs> but the answer is that the, you really can't set a percent uh, quality match cutoff, to determine whether something or not is uh, should be called an unknown. I've seen people, um, not, not really people, more like organizations, you know, set some of these cutoff values. But that's it's not super effective, right? So that that percent quality match is really like an analytical algorithm of how well that mass spectra matches those things in the database. Um, but sometimes you can have a pretty good match factor, uh, but a compound that is completely obviously not from from the device. So for example, like if the mass spectra matches cocaine and that's the top match and then the other four matches are like derivatives of cocaine, uh, yet you know for sure that there's not cocaine, then that should still be called an unknown even if the match factor was, was relatively high. And we've seen this, uh, well, I've seen it you know, personally myself, right? So if I'm reviewing this type of mass spectra data, there's, you know, the vast majority of the time, 
even a 60% match, I can see and I understand based off of the materials that it's right, right? So, so we'll call that a tentative identification, even if it's like a 60%. But there's other times where it's like 80% and it's some like uh, derivatized like drug compound or, or something else, and that's the highest match, and we just know that it's not right. In that case, it's called an unknown. So that's why there's this manual expert review needs to be part of that process. You can't just have an arbitrary... Um, and I don't mean to say arbitrary, you can't just have some specified match factor cut off without an expert review. It just won't work. Okay, great. Well, we're at the top of the hour, unfortunately, and uh, I'd love to hear more, and we have more questions. Uh, we will share your questions with Matt and Thor. They can get back to you on email. Matt, any closing statements before we go? Uh, no, I would just say, you know, thank you to everybody that uh, for participating, and thank you for the the great questions over the three days. I, you know, I think Thor and I both uh, were very, very pleased with the amount of thoughtfulness and the, the and the number of questions. I think it is reflective of the entire community here uh, being very well informed and keenly aware of uh, of current events in this in this area. So, so thanks to the audience. Great, and thank you to Matt and Thor. Uh, everyone, within the next 24 hours, you'll receive a personalized follow-up email. This will contain details and a link to today's presentation on demand. Uh, please invite your colleagues and peers who couldn't join us today to listen to this event on demand. The webinar is copyright 2020 by Informa Markets. Presentation materials are owned by or copyrighted by Nelson Labs and the individual speakers are solely responsible for their content and opinions. Uh, again, I'm Peter Krauss, and on behalf of our speakers, I'd like to thank everyone for attending this week's course. Thank you, and take care. <laughs>